invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 1. Find this on page 350 in the Bibles in your seats, 2 Samuel chapter 1. I'll begin with verse 17. Listen as I read God's word. Then David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa. Let there be no dew nor rain upon you nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war perished. <clears throat> Last Sunday would have been my father's 89th birthday. He passed away in 2022 when he was still 87. Family and I were deeply blessed by him deeply blessed by his marriage with my mom, deeply blessed by his life and Christian witness. Because of that, we rejoice knowing that when he died, he went immediately to be with his Savior, Jesus Christ, forever. And yet, grief remains. Certain things remind me of him and bring tears to my eyes still. Tragically, grief is something that we have trouble wrapping our hands around. I'd suggest that the world tries vainly to understand it and really doesn't know what to do with grief. There are certain instances where they try to express it, but they often come up empty. And I'm concerned that even within Christian circles, that the subject of grief is one that is, is pushed back against, as if it is wrong to grieve, as if you should be embarrassed if you are still grieving over something that is, uh, over, for instance, the loss of a loved one. Maybe subtle pressure that is placed on you to Get over it. Because of that, I want today to invite you to consider David's lament for Saul and Jonathan, the song of the bow. I want you to hear it in light of the greater joy of the resurrection. But we're going to contemplate the grief mostly today. Because that's what David does, and there's a reason why. I want to give just a brief introduction to what a lament is and why David would do this. After the initial grief that David expressed over Saul and Jonathan's death, David 
intentionally laments this lament. That's what the text says here. He laments with this lamentation. That means that he meditated on his grief. You might find that surprising and maybe even a little off-putting. Again, I have in mind that idea that we have trouble wrapping our minds around grief and sometimes even would suggest that a Christian should not grieve. But while we don't like grief, and we don't like it for good reason, I would suggest that there are good reasons for us to grieve. David puts them in front of us, and he does so intentionally. And here's why I say it it may seem off-putting for who in their right mind would want to remember such things as grief, as the loss of loved ones, or the terrible trial that you have gone through. Who would want to deliberately call them to mind? Because that's exactly what David does. A lamentation is to purposely call to mind a grief, to give expression to deep emotions that we experience in a reflective way. Commentator Davies calls a lament an expression of thoughtful grief. I like that term. It's an expression of thoughtful grief. Put that way, you might see that it's not so strange that we see similar items or similar efforts today in the world around us. It happens especially in the arts, both visually and uh, and uh, written and musically. I'll just mention a couple of things. Think of the, the haunting song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, that memorializes the lives that were lost in the storm in, uh, in Lake Erie. Or think of, uh, of the movie, The Titanic, that memorializes the sinking of that great ship. It does more than that, but it does at least that. There is an effort to wrap our hands around, to remember our grief, and to, to do something with it. David wrote this down. He lamented this lament. It was thoughtful. It was purposeful. He told his soldiers to teach their children this song of the bow. And here David makes use of some of his poetic skills. He carefully chooses words. He structures this song so that there, is, uh, there would be a, a memory devices so that it could be remembered and recited and likely sung over and over again. It's perfectly suited to be used in meditation. You find this a lot in some of our psalms, psalms that are also lamentations. They're full of remembering God in the midst of our troubles. So a few months ago, Dave taught a really good class on meditation. One of the points that I took away from that is that God intends for us to think deeply about who he is and what he is doing. And so the way he communicates that, there is method in his madness. Uh, That's what we might say today. God is not mad. Don't uh, post that quote on the internet that I'm calling God mad. (laughs) There's method for God in the way he communicates. It's not just facts and commands. There are times when God says things in the Bible in ways that cause you to stop and to think deeply about what is being said, to consider and to roll it around in your mind so that you would reflect on what God is doing in the midst of this circumstance in your life. 
There are aspects of God's character. There are amazing deliverances that he's wanting you to think about. So the way he tells that is reason for meditation. And grief is an opportunity for you to meditate on the goodness of God. That's where I have to say that there is more than just grief in our life because God is sovereignly overseeing them. And it is told in the context of the larger narrative of the history of redemption that we know that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. So while we grieve, we grieve not as those without hope, but we still do grieve. With that extended definition of what a lamentation is, I want you to to look at David's lamentation. We'll find that there are three aspects, three uh, realities that come through in David's lamentation that I would give to you to meditate on when you grieve personally or when you come alongside uh, someone else to grieve with them. The first thing that David grieves over is that his lamentation expresses disgrace. This is not a happy thought either. But it is part of our grief. Very natural that David would grieve the death of his close friend, and even the death of Saul, as I showed last week. But David's mourning goes deeper than just the tragedy of the loss of a friend. He grieves the greater implications that their death and their defeat represents. And he does so by mentioning two different places, Gath and Ashkelon, and then Mount Gilboa. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Let not the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, let's say, the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, he pronounces in a sense a curse on the place of the death of Saul and Jonathan. What David is doing here is he's envisioning the the victory celebrations that would be going on in the cities of the Philistines. He would know this very well because the children of Israel had done the same thing when they had had victories over the Philistines. In fact, David had been the subject of some of those celebrations. Remember what the daughters of Israel would celebrate by saying, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands and the victory celebrations that would happen. David knew that that was happening in Philistia even then. But it was even more than that because the children of Israel and the Philistines both looked on this contents, contest not just as a battle of two armies, but a battle between the God of Israel, false God of the Philistines. They understood this in spiritual terms. I'll just mention two places to help you understand this. Remember when the Philistines back early in 1 Samuel captured the Ark of the Covenant They thought they had captured Israel's God. And they took it and they put it in the temple of their God, Dagon, to celebrate their victory over the God of Israel. Remember what happened to that statue? It fell down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Not just once, but it fell down again and its head and its hands broke off. And a plague broke out all over Philistia. God was demonstrating who the victor was, even though there was, a, in a sense, a earthly victory for the Philistines. Or think of David, who went to fight against the giant, Goliath of Gath. You come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of hosts, 
the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Here David doesn't state it directly, but he doesn't need to. That was the context of the children of Israel. And so you should understand that he expresses the shame, the disgrace of Israel's defeat when he mourns Saul and Jonathan's death. And he teaches it to his followers so that they would remember it and teach it to their children. This was not just a battle cry like some, remember the Alamo. This was a memory of the crushing humiliation of what happens when the people of God forsake following their one true God. I would have you hear the very same thing in the tears of Jesus Christ. Of all people, Jesus knew that Lazarus would live again not just in the resurrection, as as Martha so sweetly and full of of faith and and grief expresses. He was going to live again in just a matter of minutes. Jesus knew this and even delayed his going to, uh, to visit his sick friend, the one whom he loved, so that his glory would be demonstrated his resurrection, and yet he still wept. And that shortest verse of the Bible, it's worthy of deep meditation, isn't it? Something to take today and to think about. Why is it that Jesus wept? Surely one reason was that he saw the effects of sin. He saw that death still reigned over the creation he had called into existence by the word of his power. And that that corruption and death was the fruit of the fall. And out of grief for that, he wept at Lazarus' tomb. You may do the same when you lament. The griefs that you suffer and the griefs that others go through will often have an element of that stain of sin and the corruption that it has brought into the world. It prompts me to think of those who are suffering even now in the persecuted church around the world or to think of those that have, uh, have suffered recently in their own bodies through disease, the loss of loved ones. As you hear these things, pause and consider. And in your grief, meditate on, on just the, the depth of of the tragedy of sin and allow that grief to be lifted up to the Lord, asking that he would arise and vindicate his own name. For grief does indeed express a lament over disgrace. Secondly, lament expresses honor. This comes through in the middle of David's words about his Uh, about Jonathan and Saul, how the mighty have fallen. The beauty of Israel has been slain. He goes on to tell their bravery in battle. The bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return empty from, uh, from the blood of the slain or the fat of the mighty. But he reflects on the fact that warfare is a deadly, uh, employment. Their shields were cast away, unanointed, he says. By that he means that um, shields that were, uh, were probably made of leather in Saul and Jonathan's day 
that those shields would have been cleaned and then wiped with oil after a battle to preserve them. But they had fallen in the battle without any care given to them. And here, for Saul and Jonathan, though their shields fell because of their deaths, there is an element of honor that is given. And David praises them for this. Look at verse 23. It says, Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. What he's doing is he's he's recognizing that Saul and Jonathan fell in defense of the people of God. That's what a king should do. He should stand for his people. And though there are are reasons to criticize and critique and to, to bemoan Saul's lack of faith, here at the last he did go to war knowing the price that might be paid, as did Jonathan. In fact, I can't help but think that David learned this type of honor of the king from Jonathan himself. Of all people, Jonathan knew how Saul had mistreated David over and over again. He had stood beside David when Saul was crazy with jealousy. He had defended David in his life. And yet, throughout Jonathan's life, where do we find him? While he defended David, he was at his father's side because he was the king. And though he was standing for righteousness, he was doing so in a way that honored the one who was anointed to be king. Where was Jonathan in his death? Beside his father. Defending people of God and the anointed king honor in that. David honors him for that. He honors Jonathan, he honors the king. And he's given something of a memorial for them. He remembers and he calls others to remember. In fact, he instructs the daughters of Israel to weep over Saul. Once more, I can't help but see Jesus' tears also falling here as a way of honoring, this case, honoring Lazarus and Martha and Mary. In doing so, he draws them deeper into God's grace. Remember that he had opportunity when he heard While Lazarus was sick, he had opportunity to go. And as the people wondered, and Mary and Martha (laughs) cried out, what if you had been here? He would not have died. And that's true. He could have come. He could have healed Lazarus, but he delayed so that the glory of God would be shown, so that Lazarus and Martha and Mary would be drawn deeper into the grace of God so that they would see this deliverance and meditate on the glory of God. It's a certain honor that the Lord gives to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha by this awful travail, death of their brother. honored them by leading them through this grief and grieving with them. We mimic that a little bit. Our funeral services, there is often a memorial that is read. It must be said that we have to be careful with those, what you say and how much you uh, uh, represent the dead. Let me say that it is okay to grieve. And it's okay to give honor to 
a faithful servant of the Lord. Remember that their light in your life is no longer there. To honor that light, to honor the Lord by grieving. Thirdly and finally, lament expresses love. This is perhaps the best-known portion of David's lament and perhaps the portion that is most mangled. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. So this is a passage that has been mangled because some have read this to say that David and Jonathan shared a homosexual relationship. More could be said here, but I'll be brief. Just say it as Davies says it. It is utterly wrong-headed to read the idea of homosexuality into this text. The comparison between Jonathan's love and a wife's love is not at the point of sexuality, but at the point of fidelity. Our world makes love only sexual. This deep love that has fidelity is one that David reflects on. I already drew your attention to this when I, when David praised Jonathan's character. Jonathan had stood beside his father while he was king. And Jonathan also honored the future king, David, one anointed by God. And even though Jonathan was naturally next in line to to rise to be king, he intentionally aligned himself with the covenant anointed king, David. He aligned himself with that even told David this, you will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. 1 Samuel 23, 17. No wonder David loved Jonathan. No wonder he could say, your love has this fidelity to it. It makes sense then that where love runs deep, that grief would also run deep. Jesus himself showed these same deep emotions at the tomb of Lazarus. As he was there, that shortest verse comes out again. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Well, the mourners identify it so well, don't they? Mourners at Lazarus' tomb understood. See, how they loved him, how he loved him. See how he loved him. This is surely as well an indication of the grief that Jesus has and an expression of his, an expression of love. It makes sense then that in our times of loss that we would grieve too. grieve and lament a number of things. There are a variety of losses, a variety of tragedies that we go through. But because it is over the death of a friend, the death of Jonathan, let me just, in closing, zero in on that, the grief of of the death of a friend. We do lament the death of a loved one because of love. And our grief expresses that. We are parted for a time. Out of love, we grieve because of that parting. We will not know the touch of their hand, the look of their eyes, the sound of their voice. We grieve over that because we are parted. But not forever. Right? Not forever.
We lament the dimming of a light that has been so bright to us. Light that we honor by our grief. Light that has been used by God in our lives. Even in their last days, they may still be used by God as Father was for me, and we honor that in our grief. But not forever. Right? Amen. We lament the spiritual reality that sin and death still have their sway on this earth. Not forever. In your grief, pray that you would meditate. You would meditate, just as David did. He was intentionally thoughtful about these things that are indeed grievous. Tears are genuine, and your grief is genuine. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to embarrass by or even to be pressured to get over. As grief comes, use it as an opportunity to meditate on disgrace, on honor, and on love. See Christ expressing these things for you and with you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I have to admit that it's hard to be thoughtful about those these grievous things. even try to push them away from ourselves because they do seem to be mindless and overpowering to us. And yet, Lord, I pray that even in the midst of our grief, you would cause us to pause and to consider what it's hard for us to see that trouble is ordained by you for our good. But instead, O Lord, as we grieve, may we understand that your deliverance goes beyond the grief of today. You are indeed reigning over all things. You have even, uh, even now defeated death, even now are reigning, and will come again to set all things right, far as the curse is found. Until then, O Lord, in our grief, I pray that we would see Christ, who is mediating for us, who is grieving with us. O Lord, I pray that as we come alongside brothers and sisters, may we enter into that grief with them. Honor and love, expressing our eternal hope, In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 116 has an element of lament in it. It speaks about being bound up with the cords of death. There's more than that, but we grieve over these hardships. We grieve in the presence of the Lord, knowing his victory in the end. Stand and sing Psalm 116a.